Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to a new week of meetings. As we begin to open the word today, as we consider that which is pre presented before us, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and for his guidance, so that we might more clearly understand the words of truth. Shall we now together seek his blessing and seek his face as we begin this study? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing, for the opportunity that we have to be able to study together, to consider the words that you are presenting, to be guided in the manner in which you would want us to be guided. Help us now, Father. Direct us in all things. May your will be done. May your angels attend us today. May your spirit enlighten us. We ask also, Father, for the forgiveness of our sins so that we might draw closer to you. Help us now in all things. For this, Father, we ask, for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when we left off on Thursday, we were addressing some points regarding Leviticus 26. Now, here... This portion of Leviticus 26 is presented before us, stating if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that they also, they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and then they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity. Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember. And I will remember the land. The land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbaths while she lieth desolate without them. And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity because even because they despise my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them for I am the Lord, their God, but I will for their sakes, remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt, into the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God, I am the Lord. Now, if, well, can I make a comment on this first? Please. Okay. So, you know, one of the things is we can see that we had read before verses 34 and 35 and onward, that this is discussed, this is describing the Babylonian captivity, of course, right? The right. land shall enjoy her Sabbaths. Um, and this is quoted in, um, as you'll see, he's going to talk about the 70 year captivity. So he's going to get this correct. And um, we also know that there's this uh, reference to coming out of Egypt, which they had just come out of. And Isaiah is going to, you know, talk about coming out of Babylonian captivity. I'm going to stretch out my hand to recover the remnant of my people, right? A second time. So, you know, it's just. When, when I studied Leviticus 26, you know, as I said before, I looked at the fulfillment of it. How was it fulfilled? And, and on Sabbath, I, I did a presentation, uh, not particularly on Leviticus 26, though I did go over it a bit, uh, but more dealing with the, um, uh, the captivity, uh, the different periods um, that was fulfilled by literal Israel. And, you know, it's just disappointing. I guess I'm so disappointed that Eugene Pruitt didn't really go farther because once he had realized that this is the Babylonian captivity, the question to ask is, well, what does the four seven times have to do with leading to the Babylonian captivity? Because this is obviously the context of this would, could lead you to look at, well, Maybe this is the events that lead to the captivity. I mean, it's just, 
you know, he's the closest uh, I've seen to somebody actually trying to spend time understanding Leviticus 26, but but he just doesn't follow through. And so it's disappointing for me. Well, I don't disagree. Here we have a person presenting his position in 2009, where this is yet in the public record. Now, I look at it and I see that Pruitt is taking the easy path. Rather than digging as a miner looking for gold or precious jewels, he's taking the words of others and trying to build on them. Now, is that the way we're supposed to study? Now, when we when we look at this further, as he's closing out this chapter, Pruitt goes, this was the promise that formed with the prayer of Solomon, the basis of Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. His prayer was one of acceptance. He acknowledged the fairness of the sentence of captivity in the light of his sins and of those of his fathers. And he asked for a reprieve. He had been studying the 70-year captivity mentioned by Jeremiah. Now he wants to go to an old format, one that was used in the 19th century. And he says, think, dear reader, would Daniel have been encouraged by the approaching end of the 70-year captivity if he thought the promise he was claiming from Leviticus 26 was connected to a 2,520-year captivity? We have praying to do, judgments to accept, sins to confess, and promises to claim. We have truth to proclaim, but Daniel won't join us in proclaiming the 2520. What do you think? Okay. Well, here, I, I, I keep, you know, I apologize that, you know, I'm going to comment right away all the time, but. It's all right. Um, I, I wrote a paper. On uh, it was it was when I was in university. It was a, a book report because I read a book that was giving the modern scholarship view of the Book of Daniel, right? And they tried to say, well, the Book of Daniel was written in the second century BC, and you know during the Mac to in connection with the Maccabean rebellion, right? So part of that history. And of course, modern scholarship does not accept the idea that people can predict the future, which is one of the reasons they put Daniel in the second century, because they try to get everything in Daniel 11 as fulfilled, you know, with the Tychus epiphanies, right? So, so of history that has happened. Of course, Daniel points forward to the future, so they try to interpret all of the events um, as something that Daniel predicts that doesn't happen. So the stuff that's future from a Tychus epiphanies, and, you know, they apply it in ways that doesn't even make any sense. But my response to that was that it's going to talk about the temple being destroyed and the city of Jerusalem being destroyed. How is that encouraging to the Daniel, right? Right. So there is kind of a question that could be asked. But one of the things we see with Daniel here is there are these periods of time that are way in the future, the 2300 days, the 1335, the 1290. If we applied that question to the 2520 in the way that he is doing, well, then we would have to make the argument that Daniel must only be encouraged if he believes that these prophecies are being fulfilled within his time. Right. Right. Because he's praying. In, in Daniel 9, because he wants to see the end of the captivity, right? He's in the, the first year of Darius the Mede in chapter 9. In chapter 10, he's he's a couple of years later. It, you could say, you know, um, he would be in the third year, right? Of course, Darius the Mede has passed away, so now they call it the third year of Cyrus, but still, from when Babylon was destroyed, and um, and he wants to know about the end of the 70-year captivity. Well, he's, he's not being, I mean, he's going to be encouraged. He's, he's going to be told that in Chapter 10, uh, that Michael the Prince has, has fought and, uh, you know, Cyrus is going to issue that decree that's going to allow them to go back to Jerusalem. 
but Grisha, Grisha has to come, right? So Daniel already has these prophecies, not just about Medo-Persia, but he's got Greece, and then he's got Rome, and then he's got the 2300 days from chapter 8, which has now been understood by him, and now he's going to have the 1290 and the 1335. He's going to know those are periods of years, right? Correct. I mean, at least he's going to know that the 70 weeks is looking at something 500 years in the future, more than 500 years in the future. So it, it, it's such a silly argument. I, I just... I just don't know how how he could make this argument. Well, here he is, very much like you asked, being sarcastic about the seven times of Leviticus 26. Yet, does he do the same thing in relation to the 2,300 evening mornings of the eighth chapter of his own book? I mean... The argument that's being placed here is entirely not logical because Daniel has been given the prophecy of the 2,300 evening mornings. He understands this is not something that's going to be accomplished in his lifetime. Then he has the prayer in Daniel 9. So if, if Pruitt is going to apply this against Leviticus 26, why isn't he is isn't he approaching it in the same way against Daniel eight? Yeah, you said it more succinctly than me, but it's it, to me it's just inexplicable. I just don't know how people do these things. It you you have to have a strong confirmation bias, a strong prejudice to make this kind of argument. Right, and his bias is completely against. Leviticus 26, and the understanding that this is the judgment that's going to be placed against Israel. Right. Now, he's, he's almost got it, though, right? He, if he took Leviticus 26 and said, yes, you know, Leviticus 26 is not about the 25, 20-year period, right? Because obviously it's not a 25, 20 year captivity. I mean, that's that's mockery because that's not what the argument is. Um, but but we also know, you know, that that Israel is captive for a long period of time. We know the 70 weeks transfers that for blessings and curses. That Christians, in a sense, are under captivity, right? We we don't end. I mean, sure, we end the Babylonian captivity, but then, you know, Greece comes in. You know, they're free from Greece for a while, and then Rome comes in. Um, and then, you know, first pagan Rome, and then papal Rome. And it's just, I don't know. I, I, and when I, when I was studying it back, you know, in 2010 uh, uh, and then 11, I finally accepted the 2520 after about a year of study in 2011. And I said, okay, you know, this makes sense. I, I can support this now. And I didn't fully understand everything. But the one thing I knew is that the arguments that were being brought against Leviticus 26 made no sense. They, they were just, they, they weren't good arguments. Even though I knew that I couldn't explain everything, uh, it was pretty clear that, that this was fulfilled by literal Israel. And that it's connected to the, the other time prophecies in Daniel. I just, you know, I hadn't worked out all the periods of 70 years and the decrees and stuff yet because I, I hadn't confirmed the chronology at that time. But at least I could understand that, that the arguments, and that's mostly where I took the position that I supported Leviticus 26 is connected to a 25, 20 year period, is that the arguments of those that opposed it were bad arguments and misrepresentations. It, it's like um, on Facebook right now, I'm having a discussion, sort of. It's not really a discussion because the guy's not discussing. But, you know, he's, it's, he's attacking the spirit of prophecy. And to do so, he has to use very 
lots of, all kinds of misrepresentations, all kinds of specious arguments, you know, all kinds of listening to gossip and rumors. And, and, and so when somebody does an argument like that, if you have the truth on your side, it's pretty simple. You never have to misrepresent when somebody's teaching error. You can present the truth, and it'll be pretty obvious that the person's presenting error. But when people are presenting truth, you, you can't just use truth to, to show that they're you know, in error because they're not in error, right? So you have to misrepresent. You, you have to bias the mind. You have to use all those po the polemical arguments. You have to manipulate your reader so that they actually don't see what is being said. They, you, you have to use all these straw man arguments. And, and that's what he's doing. So it's just disappointing. Disappointed. I don't know. <laughs> I keep saying it, but it, it's true. I, I don't I don't understand this this way of approaching things. Okay. Now next Pruitt changes subject and he wishes to defend the theory of evolution. For we all know that Life began as a single cell organism and progressed to becoming more and more complex. So Pruitt writes, the pioneers became right. This inference is saying that the pioneers were wrong. Think about that for a moment. William Miller was wrong. Joshua Himes was wrong. Well, this, this sort of thinking has been applied uh, within Adventism, within Christianity, and it's it's the false theory that of, as you're pointing out, of the evolution of religious belief. Right. And, and it's such a dangerous uh, premise that somehow we we start with error, and as we progress, it's the false theory of progress. I remember being in court one time and uh, the judge saying, well, we used to, you know, take a different position on this point than in the past, but, but the, the, new, the, the, the new understanding and inter interpretation of the law is correct. And, and that comes from a belief that we're always progressing to be better, right? Um, now, we know as Seventh-day Adventists that that the progress that has occurred within the world is really not progress, it's regress. Right. Right? That old truths need to be uncovered because they've been buried up with tradition. So no Seventh-day Adventist in his right mind would, would ever take this position. The pioneers became right. Now, we can say that God has been unfolding truth because that's mu a much different idea, right? That means in order to progress in the Christian life, if you look at your own personal life, light has come to you and you've responded to that light. Now, in some ways you could say, well, I'm becoming more correct in my understanding. But you're not constantly abandoning things that God showed you and then adopting new ideas. You're, you can you, you should be able to see in your Christian life that that light that came to you when light first came to you and you responded to now actually shines brighter. It's more meaningful than when you first perceived it. You see things more clearly, but in the way that he's wording this, which and in the way that he's actually applying it, it's 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 the same idea. Their ideas changed. And, and that's evolution. It's well, from one species to another, um, and, and and it's a false idea of progress. So, in this in, in this situation, we have to presume that Pruitt has read a lot of the Spirit of Prophecy. Could we agree with that? Yeah, he's read he's read a lot of that all way. Okay. Now, with this in mind, there is a statement that she has made that we've often quoted, that 
God sent his angel to impress upon the, the heart of a farmer. Now, do you remember something along that line? Yeah, and, and, and God gave him the commencement of the chain of truth. Okay. And we know now, that Miller, Miller lays that out, and Ellen White actually lays it out as well in The Great Controversy. Um, by quoting Miller when he talks about uh, the prophecies and so forth. So that chain of truth is, you know, three eights, right? 508, 508, 677, 457, and 508, 508 AD, the other one's BC dates. But those are the dates that God gave him. And so Ellen White confirms that. So would we then accept that on the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established. Because if this, if this is what God's angel, who we have studied and we have agreed would be Gabriel, brought this to William Miller's attention, then the dates 677, 457, and 508 are messages and symbols that are coming directly from the throne of grace. Yet Pruitt proceeds here to state the pioneers became right. The pioneers, in another way of saying it, evolved. As they studied during the formative years from 1833 to 1863, here giving an application to a 30-year period where he would believe that the message was correct, many of their ideas changed. From the timing of Sabbath to the timing of the 2300 days, from the identification of the two-horned beast to that of the scarlet beast, from the shut door of probation to the shut door of the holy place, the pioneers were learning. Their publications show it to be so, they were glad to admit. It is ironic that we have picked up a teaching that they, for good reason, were dropping. We would do well to leave it where the first pioneer to ever really examine the source of the 25-20 day prophecy left it. That was Uriah Smith. Okay, so I don't, I don't really follow what he says in that uh, previous paragraph there where, um, so, uh, so, I mean, obviously the timing of the Sabbath, that was an unfolding of truth, right? Right. So, as I say, ideas changed. I, I mean, we know that God gives progressive light. So they, they hadn't been given the, the time of the Sabbath. They just assumed it was going to be uh, 6 p.m., right? That was right. their their view. They interpreted evening at 6 p.m. And then later they, they accepted, you know, sunset. Okay. That's what he's referring to them. From the identific identification of the two-horned beast to that, of the scar to that of the scarlet beast. So I'm not really sure what he's saying here. Because um, they understood the two-horned beast to be the United States. Right? Right. Um, I mean, obviously, they came to understand that. It, it, there, I mean, there are things that they didn't understand about it. And I'm not sure what the Scarlet Beast, what it is that they supposedly changed on. <clears throat> now, from the shut door, Ellen White still accepts the shut door. So we, we know that the shut door probation, they came to understand it more clearly, that it wasn't for the world, it was for Adventists. Right. Um, so the pioneers were learning. We can agree. But Leviticus 26, there's still more to learn from it. One thing we're not going to do is abandon it. Um, so Uriah Smith definitely doesn't do a very good job of and, and examine the source of the 25, 20 day prophecy. Right. Uh, what's the source? Uh, he doesn't examine the source at all, right? I mean, he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't understand it. He doesn't. 
He doesn't try to apply Leviticus 26 and give an explanation of it. He makes a claim that it has nothing to do with time, when clearly Pruitt has already shown that it does, because he has the 70-year prophecy from Leviticus 26. So I don't know how you can argue it has nothing to do with time. Now, just to go back to where we were talking about um, the commencement of the chain of truth. Right. Um, it, I'm not going to read that quote. But in the Great Controversy, uh, what a person needs to do is read um, page 323 and 324. Ellen White's going to talk about uh, Miller there, and and she's going to quote him, right? And 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 at first she's going to quote him and then kind of paraphrase him, right? He's going to talk about these different prophecies that were fulfilled in the Bible. Uh, the seven days that were um, the 120 years of the flood, the seven days that were to precede it with 40 days predicted, the 400 years of the sojourn of Abraham's seed, all of these types of things. See, they're going to be listed, right? And and that's going to be from uh, William Miller's memoirs uh, by Bliss, page 74 and 75. So she's uh, going to quote that paragraph. And then she's going to the second paragraph from Miller's memoirs, she's going to paraphrase more and directly quote. Because um, he's going to say, when therefore I found in my study of the Bible that the seven times continuance, the 1335 and the 2300 days, right, all extended to the second coming of Christ, she's going to just say, when therefore he found in his study of the Bible various chronological periods that according to his understanding of them, extended to the second coming of Christ, he could not but regard them as the times before appointed. So those various chronological periods that she is referencing here, there's three of them, right? Now, you have to go back and look at Miller's memoirs to see that she is paraphrasing this paragraph. She's leaving out what those various chronological periods are, but definitely... She's endorsing them if you read it carefully. So um, we know that um, when, when you look at this, uh, you know, this statement about the commencement of the chain of truth, and you look at Miller's statements, you can definitely see that 677 and 457 and 50880 are going to be the, the commencement, right? So if you just say, Ellen White says, well, he was given the commencement of the chain of truth, and you ask, well, what is that? Well, that's going to be 677 BC, okay. right? Because that's the commencement of this chain. But but people never take the time to examine things. You know, it's now I understand. You know, it was hidden from us, but I don't think it should be hidden from us now. I mean. If Pruitt had followed proper way of studying, he would have come to the conclusion that we have come to regarding uh, the 25 of 20, right? If he had taken the time, he would have seen the fulfillment of the four seven times. He would be doing this right now. He would be reading out in his study. Right. Um, and, and showing where, you know, Uriah Smith was in error. But instead, it's left to us do this at this time well we're going to see a little bit more in the way that Pruitt is approaching this as we go to the next pages now there are many other teachings that the pioneers were picking up when they were putting this one down these deserve more of our study the seal of god the mark of the beast the message to laodicea the third angel's message and righteousness by faith post conclusion questions what if the seven items or repetitions are used? If one assumes, despite the evidence, that the passages in Leviticus do refer to years, however, there is no reason to read them as more or less than literal years. The other blessings and curses in the chapter are manifestly literal. And we could ask okay. ourselves. Um, okay, so they're definitely not literal. Um, right. You know, I mean, 
they're literally fulfilled, but there's all kinds of symbols being used in Leviticus 26. Right. I mean, so, I mean, you go through the four, seven times, you're going to see literal thing. Now, um, so, and obviously we believe that they're literal years. So, so he says, well, we're going to be literal. He's already given the 70 years captivity from Leviticus 26. And that definitely is based upon A7. But he hasn't really considered, you know, what he's done. Now, we do say that they were fulfilled in seven-year periods. So in the period, in the time of the judges, we do have periods of seven years. So, it, I mean, it, to me, it seems that, you know, he, he's not seeing what's right in front of his eyes. Right. So... He then attempts these applications by stating, and we could ask ourselves, were there several seven-year periods of catastrophe in the history of Israel that were the result of wrongdoing? There were. So he goes to Judges 6.1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian seven years. Then spoke Elisha unto the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou and thine household, and sojourn, wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. 2 Kings 8.1 A third incident could have occurred, could have occurred, again, could have occurred, during the reign of David, if he had chosen it from a list of terrible alternatives. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in the land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. 2 Samuel 24.13 In summary, if Leviticus 26 is read literally, as Adventist standard principles of prophetic interpretation would require, and if we understand seven in the chapter to mean seven years, then we could find, in the days of the judges and of the prophets, several fulfillments of the prophecy. He continues, what about Ellen White's endorsement of the 1843 chart? One expositor has long taught that the glorious land of Daniel 11 is the United States. He was reasonably enthused, therefore, when he found that Hiram Edson had taught the same thing in a long article. The article is the one mentioned earlier in this chapter that also addressed a 25-20 year prophecy that had been the subject of several lectures by William Miller. That expositor has now been teaching about the 2520 for several years and making frequent references to Edson's article. And he reasoned that Ellen White's endorsement of the 1843 chart, which includes a reference to the 2520, is sufficient reason to have confidence in the 2520 prophecy. Ellen White never mentioned the prophecy, but she did indeed more than once endorse the prophetic charts that included that prophecy. I think something ought to be said about these endorsements. Now, so he's talking about Jeff here. So he's talking about Jeff. Yes, he is. Yeah. And he's, he's sort of misrepresenting things a little bit, but it's it's not bad so far. I mean, it's kind of true, but it's it's still he's not he's not doing it fairly right in other words this is a very unbalanced examination yeah now it's pretty common though i mean we sometimes do that too i mean <clears throat> we, we've all been in this position where we, we we see something to be error and instead of you know presenting the person's argument in as strong a way as we can you know, we do dismiss it. We've all done that. Uh, sure. But it is not a Christ-like way to do it. And because of how I've seen other people do it, as time has gone on in my Christian experience, I'm, I'm less prone to do it to others. 
does it matter? You know, even if I know them to be error, if I'm going to do a study about, you know, Mormons or something, I'm not going to uh, give a caricature of what they believe and pick out all, all the things I would, uh, and, and misrepresent it so that a, a Mormon uh, reading my paper would, would just dismiss what I'm saying because it's so ludicrously wrong. And we've seen that with Adventism. We see that with all kinds of things that people say against Adventism, and they have no idea what it is they're refuting. So one of the things that you always are trying to do is to win the person uh, who believes those things. And if you misrepresent it, you're not going to be able to do a very good job of winning that person. So he's not doing anything to win us who believe in the 2520. He's, what he's doing is trying to set up a bias against those who might be thinking of looking into the 2520 so that they don't look into it. Right. Now, he continues and he quote, gives these two quotes from the pen of inspiration. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Further, I saw that the truth should be made plain upon tables, that the earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord's, and that necessary means should be should not be spared to make it plain. I saw that the old chart was directed by the Lord, and that not a figure of it should be altered except by inspiration. I saw that the figures of the chart were as God would have them, and that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures, so that none should see it till his hand was removed. Spalding and McGann, page one. What can be confidently stated from the endorsements is that God intended that the charts would be made, would be used, and would be a continual source of instruction to Adventists even long after 1844. And more than this, we can confidently gather from the endorsements that no one should be searching for new dates to fulfill the 2300-day prophecy, as First-day Adventists did when they expected the prophecy to end in 1845 or 46, 48, 51, etc. The figures in the charts were as God would have them. Hiram Edson thought the hidden mistake was the figures regarding the 2520, but the endorsement said that not a figure should be changed without special revelation has been made to say something more than it does, namely that every element of the chart is accurate. So is Pruitt then stating that not every element of the chart is accurate okay so so um so he he accepts that there's an endorsement of the chart so obviously we're not going to he says we're not going to look for new dates to fulfill the 2300 day prophecy right so that's so he's saying that's kind of what Anna White's saying is we we just are correct as far as the time periods now He's going to say Hiram Edson thought the hidden mistake was the figures regarding the 2520. Well, Hiram Edson says nothing about that that I have seen in when I read the articles. I don't think that that he makes that argument. I could be wrong, but I you know I haven't read through his his uh, seven articles recently. But uh, yeah, so so I'm not really sure what. It, yeah, he seems to be saying, well, not every element of the chart is accurate. I'm, I'm not sure if that's what he's saying. Uh, I mean, he must be saying it, but he's he's kind of skirting around it a little bit. So he's he's going to say this is a gentle pro- protest against that conclusion. Huh. Anyway, I do want to comment, though, about Ellen White's endorsements of the chart. So he's he's taken a couple of statements here but he hasn't really looked at it thoroughly enough right. because people often say Ellen White never, never mentions the 25. She never mentions the 2520, right? That's, but that, that's not correct. 
So you're going to see these statements here. Uh, let me see if I can find it. So, well, and I'm not sure. So, to... so first, we're going to the first. There's the statement in early writings, page 74. There's there's two different statements, page 74 in early writings and page 236. Okay. If you examine these two statements, you will see clearly that Ellen White is referencing the prophetic periods that we would call the 2520. It's included in that. So she says, uh, I've seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Then she says, in Early Writings 236, the hand of the Lord was removed from the figures. The mistake was explained. They saw that the prophetic periods reached to 1844 and that the same evidence which they had presented to show that the prophetic periods closed in 1843 proved that they would terminate in 1844. So the mistake, the hand was removed and the mistake was explained. And we know what the, the mistake was. It had to do with the ending of the prophetic periods. Now, the question is, on the 1843 chart, what are the prophetic periods that are shown to, re, um, to reach to 1843, but then are then seen to reach to 1844? So okay. where is the mistake on the 1843 chart? Is it at the bottom? I was always looking at the at, at the one directly under the pagan Rome symbol. The math is right but it's only taking the 1335 and the 1290 is extending for 45 years. That, but that's correct. Yeah, the math is right. The application... And the 45 years is correct, too. Okay. Because remember that the, the 1335 and the 12... And the 12... Well, the 1335, the 1290, they both start in 508. They're not affected by... The, the change in um, like the no zero year, right? Right. The 1335 and the 12 aren't, aren't affected by that. And they, what, what we see at the bottom of the chart is that that is the Jewish year, 1843, right? That part wasn't fully understood when they made the chart, but it's not really a mistake in the chart because it is true that the 1335 ends at the sunset on April 18th, 1844. Now, it still is the Jewish year, 1843, right? So that is correct. Just as the 538 BC date for the fall of Babylon is also correct, but instead of being a spring to spring year, as we see with the 1843 date at the bottom, it's going to be a fall to fall year. So it's, it's going to be uh, the 16th day of the seventh month, um, when Babylon falls. That means it's going to be 16 days into the year on the Jewish calendar, the civil year, 538 B.C. So, so the mistake is not at the bottom. There's no mistake there. The only mistake is in the top right-hand corner. And if you think about it, uh, God held his hand over the chart and hid a mistake in some of the figures. No, the 70 weeks is not on there, right? The right. prophetic period of the 1335 is correct. So that means the only prophetic periods that had a mistake in them are the 2300 days and the 2520. So is... Right? And, and those are the ones that were seen not to end in 1843, not to close in 1843, but to close or to terminate in 1844. So... She must be referring to those two prophetic periods in the top right hand of the corner of the chart. Right. Okay. So that's that's my what I found when I studied this. That that she she is referring to the twenty five twenty and the twenty three hundred days when she says prophetic periods. Because um Ty Gibson tried to argue, oh, prophetic periods that includes the seventy weeks and and, and so forth, all the prophetic periods. 
But if you examine what she's saying here about the mistakes on the chart, you can't say that she's talking about just prophetic periods in general, because there is only two prophetic periods on the 1844 chart that end in 1844 that are first seen as ending in 1843. There's only two periods. The 70 weeks is not on there. And of course, it doesn't end in 1844. Ty Gibson tries to argue that they just include the prophetic periods altogether. That's why they use it in the plural. But but you can clearly see that that's not how it's used. Um, and there's other places, of course, like the one in Great Controversy, that, that where she talks about the various chronological periods, where she's paraphrasing Miller, and he lays them out as those three periods, the 25, 20, 2300 days, and the 1335. So anyway, that's my two bits on that. Well, it's, all, it's also kind of interesting because what you're pointing out on both the 2520 and the 2300, that there's no recognition for the change from BC to AD. Right, right, which, which the 1335 is not affected by. Right. Right, so, so that figure is correct. But in the top right-hand corner, as the date, the math adds a zero, but BC to AD does not. You can't just say that they're ending in the Jewish year 1843 because they're not, right? It, that's going to be the 1335. So, so what you have is actually another year has to be added in a sense, right? That's why it has to be 1844. And, right, makes sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's. I mean, I deal with it in some papers in detail and explain it all. But you know, sometimes people have a hard time uh, understanding because it's not just the fullness of the year. And I think it was Dwayne Dewey who tried to argue that there was no, it wasn't a zero year mistake. It was a fullness of the year mistake. Uh, but he he misunderstands what the Millerites were doing. That would apply to. 18 uh, to the 1335, the fullness of the year, that, that would address it to some degree. But it doesn't address uh, Christ returning in the fall. So when they deal with that initial fullness of the year, if you want to call it that, all, all they could do is extend the prophetic periods to the spring of 1844, right? Does that make sense? It works. Okay. So so you can you can bring it to the spring. And, and they show that, that that you can't go past the spring of 1844 for the because what they want to have when they do the fullness of the year is they want the 1843 date to be correct, but they're just going to say it's not dealing with, um, you know, the year on our calendar. It's dealing with a Jewish year. And then Hiram Metzen does try to apply that. But if you still went to the fullness of the year, you wouldn't get to the 10th day of the seventh month. The most you could get to is to the year, you know, beginning, you know, all the way up to the end of the Jewish year in the fall. That would be uh, the 12th of October. That's as far as you could go if you just use the fullness of the year for the 2300 days ending in the fall. It would have to end on October 12th because October 13th is going to be the first day of the seventh month. So it wouldn't bring you to October 22nd. You you actually have to recognize that there is no zero year. And and that's that was you know that was part of the reason why they couldn't go past the spring of 1844 with Miller's prediction. Okay. So so the mistake is that they didn't take into account the math. Okay. Now as Pruitt continued this is a gentle protest against that conclusion. One of my favorite pioneers, Stephen Haskell, made a similar mistake in regarding to the endorsement Ellen White made of the pioneer view of the daily. He thought that a plain reading of, the, of an early statement in early writings ought to settle the issue of the definition of the daily. 
but Ellen White protested against this idea. She indicated that he was reading into the statement more than she was intending to communicate. She does not say that. She what? She does not say that. Agreed. So this inference that he's placing becomes um, rather interesting. So if a modern expositor has made a similar mistake in value judgment as Stephen Haskell, I would not take him to task regarding it, but I would offer some helpful thoughts. Ellen White made another endorsement of the history of the history, which illustrates the point that broad endorsements should not be taken as recommending all details of a publication. And we can agree with that, right? Okay. That's true. All, when, when Ellen White endorses something, that doesn't mean that she, you know, she endorses, in a, in a sense, Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, you know, the God's helping hand, you know. And, and he's going to now mention uh, uh, the Daystar Extra, February 7th, 1846. So, yeah, you wouldn't, you, you don't, you, you wouldn't make the statement that when Ellen White endorses something, everything must be accepted, every detail. But she's making a very specific statement that the figures on the chart are correct. They were right. as God would want, right? So she's being specific. And, and so we know that everything they understood about the figures and, and the prophecies, there was a mistake there, and she's going to even point that out. But yeah, now he's going to address this uh, Crozier's article, which, which I've seen people use. Um, but that's also um, clarified in the spirit of prophecy. So she's, she's not endorsing everything that he says, right? So anyway, go, go on. So the quote is, from a word to the little flock, I believe the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days is the new Jerusalem temple, of which Christ is a minister. The Lord showed me in vision more than one year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, etc., and that it was his will that Brother Crozier should write out the view which he gave us in the Daystar Extra, February 7th, 1846. I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra to every saint. That article by Crozier addressed the issue of the transition between the Holy Place Ministry and the Most Holy Place Ministry of Jesus. It placed the beginning of the seventh trumpet in the seventh Jewish month of 1844 so that is so that the seventh trumpet does begin in the seventh jewish month of 1844 okay right is he going to argue that this is not correct i'm he's going to say argue whether crozier's right or wrong right Um, okay so the article or the portion that he chooses to quote states, the opinion generally obtains that the seventh trumpet ushers in the age to come. The first thing upon its sounding are great voices saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. These voices must be heard in the world in which these kingdoms are. It is also evident that the kingdoms sustain a different relation to God at the time these voices are heard from what they did before the seventh trumpet sounded. The declaration, he shall reign forever and ever, and the humble expression of thanks from the four and twenty elders, a symbol of the whole church, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned, shows that at that time he began to reign in a special sense. Such voices have been heard since the seventh month of 1844 and produced the effects here described, deep humiliation and profound gratitude. This change of the relation of the kingdoms of this world to Christ is the same as making his enemies his footstool, Hebrews 10.13, which event was expected by him while he sat at the right hand of the Father, fulfilling the daily ministration 
verses 11 and 12. So here he goes forward. Rather than arguing that Crozier was right or wrong, I would like to do a simple deduction. If Crozier is wrong in this point, then we cannot take Ellen White's endorsement of his true light regarding the sanctuary as evidence that every point was correct. And if Crozier is right on this point, then the seventh trumpet began to sound in 1844 and not in 2001, as some would say. So he is saying that we have taught that the seventh trumpet sounds in 2001. Didn't Jeff say that at one point? Nope, never. Okay. No, we've never taught that the seventh trumpet sounded in 2001. We've always taught that the seventh trumpet sounded on October 22, 1844. The third woe, which is part of the seventh trumpet, is fulfilled in 2001. Right. But we know that the trumpets, for instance, the fifth trumpet, when does it begin to sound? So the fifth trumpet that has the first woe, when does it begin to sound? Wasn't that about 606? Yeah, so 606, 607. What's that? It's okay, I was taking a stab at it. Okay, yeah, so it's going to be um, dealing with the rise of Islam, right? The, the fifth trumpet. But the first woe doesn't begin when the fifth trumpet sounds. It's not going to begin the, 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 the first woe until, uh, you know, 1299, right? Right. Okay. So that means when a trumpet sounds doesn't mean the woe begins. Now, we know that uh, when the sixth trumpet sounds, that's going to be when the second woe begins. We also know that that woe ends prior to the sounding of the seventh trumpet, right? Originally, the Millerites believed that the seventh trumpet would sound when the second woe ended. But we know that the sixth trumpet continued to sound until October 22nd, 1844. And then the seventh trumpet began to sound. And then the third woe, uh, the early Adventist pioneers, uh, they believed that it would have something to do with a, a conflict, right? That was the angry of the nations. But they didn't really have a date for the third woe. Now, some people tried to apply it to the plagues themselves, right? You know, so that it's applied to the plagues. But after 9-11, we came to understand that the third woe had already commenced with the attack on the Twin Towers. So, so we never ever taught that the seventh trumpet began to sound in 2001. Jeff never ever taught that, and I've never ever heard anybody teach that. Okay. So, here it continues, and we're going to come to a point here that I find to be most egregious. But all we need to recognize is that God recommends persons and their ministry without conferring on them or their works a sort of infallibility. And such a recommendation has been made regarding what Ellen called the old chart. During Ellen White's lifetime, in fact, for 50 plus years of her lifetime, 1861 to 1915, the charts were reprinted without a reference to the 25, 20 year prophecy and never was the adoption of the adaption of the chart to drop this point commented on. While this admittedly proves nothing, it does indicate something regarding how the pioneers understood Ellen White's endorsement of the chart. Now, there was a picture that I saw several years ago, and I believe it was it was either Brother Haskell or Brother Loughborough that was speaking in Walla Walla, where one of the colleges is, and he had the 1843 chart up behind him, and this presentation was being given prior to Mrs. White's passing. We know that in 1843 that 300 of those charts were 
printed. Now, what chart in the plural is he referencing that does not have the 2520 on it? The only one that could have been was the 1863 chart. It is not either of the 1843 or the 1850 chart because both of those show the 2520. So he's leaving out the 1850 chart. Now, I don't know when the 1850 chart was found, um, uh, exactly when the movement noticed it. Because, um, uh, you know, we first knew about the 1843 chart. And obviously, the 1850 chart was around when I joined the movement in 2010. I don't know if anybody knows when we started using both charts. Now, the 1850 chart, we only have one copy of the original chart left that I know of. Uh, the 1843, there are several different copies of it that survived. The 1850 chart did not, um, but we know the story of the fact that it was at, um, there was the one copy and that it was found behind a filing cabinet and the last person to sign it out was Broom. Right. But I guess he must have put it behind the filing cabinet for some reason. And that's the chart that, you know, we see, you know, the reprint of on behind you on the wall on the right side. Right. 1850 chart. Now, that, of course, has the 2520. Just a so question there, Theo. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is it possible that the chart somehow rolled back behind that filing cabinet? Like, I mean, did Froome intentionally put it behind that cabinet is one possibility? Is there a possibility well, that possibility. somehow? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah, I don't know. Because I, I, I person might have. Yeah, I don't know about how the situation was sped up and how it got behind there. All we know is the simple yeah. fact that Froome was the last one who signed it out, and um, it was hidden. You know, whether that was just yeah. in God's yeah. providence that it rolled behind a, a cabinet, you know, and uh, that's cabinet. kind of where I was thinking too, like God, God's providence as well. Somehow involved, yeah. for sure. Even if Froome hit it, it'd still be in God's providence. But, right. um, yeah, so, so a, good, a good little point right there. Now, but, but the thing is, he leaves out here, uh, Pruitt does. Um, now, some people just tried, like people like um, Vance Farrell say, well, the, you know, the 2520 was not on the 1850 chart. And then when somebody points out to him it is, he then, as well, it's in such small print, you'd have to use a magnifying glass to see it. And of course, that's not the case. Maybe if it's on his uh, laptop uh, and, you know, he's zoomed out. Uh, and, and then, you know, then they try to say, well, it's smaller. But so is the 2300 days smaller. Everything's smaller because they have other things on the chart. But um, the worst thing about this, though, uh, besides all of that skipping of everything is um uh, this these charts were reprinted without reference to the 25 20 year prophecy so you're saying that this must be i mean obviously all of the charts that are reprinted all have the 25 20 year prophecy on them and and then he says and never was the adaption of the chart to drop this point commented on now of course that is is a really important detail do we see any record in Adventist writings of any discussion regarding dropping the 2520? Now, we know the 1260 is also not in the 1863 chart. Neither is the 1335 or the 1290. And they're not even referred to in, in the key to the prophetic chart. So it's not just that they're not on the chart at all. They're, they're not even referenced. Though the start of the 2520 for Judah is referenced in the key, uh, Uriah Smith is still going to have 677 BC as the beginning of Babylon. And that means that the 1863 chart is also um, a 2520 chart because it's going to start with Babylon, right? With the, the beasts. Right. And if Babylon starts with 677, then tacitly, it's also a 25, 20-year chart, just not on the chart itself. 
the key is going to tell you that. And we, of course, have the 70, the 70 weeks with the 70th week marked out, and that contains within it not just the 2520 for Christ, but also symbolizes the 2,604 years of the prophetic year that end in 1863. So, so the 1863 chart has hidden in the top right-hand corner something that now the hand is removed from. So just like the 1843 chart, the 1863 uh, chart also has its hand removed to, to reveal something that we now can see. Right? We can see that that 70th week it, it, it's so providential, but of course he's not going to notice any any of this because he's he's already started down a course that is quite dangerous, you know, in his rejection of the pioneer view of the daily, his misrepresentation of what Ellen White says about that, um, his misrepresentation of 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 what an endorsement means. As, as somehow that we can then dismiss something that Adam White specifically lays out. The figures are correct, right? And that there is a mistake. And what was the mistake? We know what it is. She tells us. And it was corrected. And it's corrected on the 1850 chart, right? Correct. So 1850 chart has the 2520. So it, it, it's just all of the things he's not telling us. And then the things that he's telling us that are misleading, it, it's just it's just so disappointing. It's disappointing. It's frustrating. His logic, again, is that he is attempting to sway people to agree with him and not present things for others to consider. So, like, uh, I've been on Sabbath here in Australia doing presentations on the prophetic periods and, and the chronology and so forth. And when I present, I mean, I do want to, to show people. I have to break down all of these prejudices and biases that exist because of, of articles like this. But in doing that, I never misrepresent anything, right? I, I explain the arguments that people have in their fullness, right, and not in sort of a uh, mockery or, uh, you know, in a weak way. Um, but then I can demonstrate with truth why those things are wrong. And, and it's very, very powerful. People can Amen. see it. You know, they can see it when you have truth on your side. You have so much power on your side. What Satan has done is he's he's always going to misrepresent. And I'm not saying that Pruitt's a satanic person or anything like that. But he is he has been deceived by these types of arguments. And those are going to lead us away from the truth. And 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 it and, and it's sad to see. It's sad to see the type of biases that exist. But when you present things plainly and simply, and and if I and if I had presented in a mocking manner, I don't think that that would be very effective. I think that you need to present the the truth plainly and openly. You need to look at what other people are saying in in the true light of what they're saying. And, but it's easy to do when when you have truth on your side. It's not easy to do when you have error on your side. When you have error on your side, it's really hard to present an argument without resorting to misrepresentation, ad hominem, straw man, all those types of things. Because you don't have truth to show that you're, you're correct. You understand, it's, it's a pretty simple point. To convict, truth to convict. You mentioned disappointment. I wanted to say that I listened to my, uh, I recorded my disfellowship in 2013 and I listened to one of the segments I found to, uh, yesterday. After many years, I listened to it this morning and I, 
disappointment would really describe how I felt. A lot of disappointment in how everything happened, but uh, as well, you know, I'm not it's in God's hands, and it didn't it didn't shake me out. But uh, yeah, disappointment in how 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 disappointment in how hearing all of the all of the false arguments just repeated and I was like a lamb you know I didn't re I was not prepared and I just accepted it but uh, yeah disappointment go ahead Theodore what were you going to say about that well yeah just the July 7th that you did this fellowship day and that's going to be uh, obviously a symbol 7 7 right mm -hmm. so that meant mm -hmm. into your right. oh. Seventh day of the seventh month, 2013. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, quite a day, and I recorded it, and they really objected when they found out that I was recording it. It was like being before the the crowd crying for Barabbas. Honestly, when the associate pastor brought it to the attention of the 30 or so people there, do you see what he's doing? Is this okay? He was like rowling up the crowd or whatever. You know, rousing up the crowd. <laughs> and didn't, and, didn't uh, I, could, I could be remembering this wrong, I'm sorry, but didn't they try to say that that was illegal? Yeah, uh, something like this, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> illegal. You, you're not allowed. No, 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 no. What they said is that I had to delete it, and I said, well, I will if it is illegal. Yeah, but, but it's I, not. I, a, if it was against the law. But it's not against the law because, against in Canada at least, yeah, it's not because against the law. it was now, course, publicly, uh, it was yeah. delivered, it was delivered to be intended to be delivered to the public, like in, in the public, so heard by. It wasn't a private well, conversation. Yeah, well, what it can't be used for is it, 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 it would, things that are recorded when it comes to in a court of law, if they're going to be used as evidence, right? But as far as anybody right, recording right. anything, you can record anything that anybody says. If somebody says something to you, you can record it. You don't have to have their permission to record it. Uh, the only thing that will right. be a dispute is whether it's admissible in court. But that, but it's never mm -hmm. illegal to record uh, a person uh, who's talking to you in in any situation. And I, I and I thought when they were objecting that they didn't, they felt, oh, Barber, sorry, Barber said that he felt uncomfortable with it and that he might, or that he probably would have agreed if I had asked in advance and asked me to turn it off. And I'm like, sure, I stopped. But then I thought, you're uncomfortable with me recording it, but there's an angel recording it. So, yeah. Good point. All right. It, you know, it does bring back a memory because I was at meetings that led to the disfellowshipment of a brother. I attended the elders meeting. I attended the general administration meeting. And I attended the full church meeting when this brother was disfellowshipped. I remember the pastor of the church becoming very angry when there were two of us as witnesses that came for the first meeting. And he made it very clear that this was not going to happen if there were going to be witnesses. When it was myself alone that came the next time for the witness, he allowed it only with the proviso that I was not allowed to speak. I've observed these type of kangaroo courts, and no offense is meant to the kangaroos in Australia, but I am, I'm left with a great consternation that such would be the way that things would be handled by a church that has been granted great light. 
I don't know what else to say. Now, Pruitt's next portion, his chapter 12, reapplications, multiple fulfillments, and the storyline, goes into some other points regarding different prophetic periods. We'll consider going whether we go into this or if we return to some of the other points that we're looking to address at this point. Okay. Well, I mean, we, I, I mean, we've dealt with Pruitt's article, so we're done with that. Right. right? Correct. So um, I do think we need to go to um, Uriah Smith. I want to go through he, uh, chapter 10, 11, and 12, okay. even if we, even if we don't go through in detail, I don't know. We can skip pieces of it. But but uh, um, I think it would be interesting to look at what his thoughts on Daniel say. I mean, I mean we've all read Daniel and Revelation by Uriah sure. Smith, I hope. Um, but just in the light of the context of what we have been studying on this as sort of um, an overview of our understanding of Daniel's last vision and and some of the differences. And, and I think it would be a good review. Um, as I'm working on the paper, I've been going through chapter 10, and there are some points that we need to discuss. Um, there's a guy from England who, who has differences from how we understand, you know, who Michael is and so forth, and he has some arguments where he, he tries to, uh, he has trouble sorting out the different characters involved, who's who's being referred to. He, he's actually pretty close. It's just, uh, he, he makes a couple of minor errors. But uh, but I think it would be interesting to see that, to, to go to that study, to back to Uriah Smith. Um, obviously, we dealt with chapter 12 already. And I don't think we want to go through chapter mm-hmm. 11 in detail. Theodore, did you notice the email uh, I sent four articles by Eugene Pruitt that I found in my archives, along with what I found with my disfellowship? Did Did you get them? Um, Wait, did Wait? Well, I, I thought did, you'd I be interested get, in them. Yes. So, you, well, you got the Eugene Pruitt's and Jeff's. Uh, so his response to Jeff, the letters, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, yeah, I did, uh, get did, it I, did I did I send the uh, I had a copy of a email thread with the great controversy Larry Kirkpatrick's uh, thread? Uh, it's uh, quite a collection of uh, objections and attacks on Jeff. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's a good one too. I'm not sure if I sent it, but I will. It was. Uh, yeah, that one you didn't send summer. to me. I got Jeff's okay. and you oh, oh, oh. and and then I have your recordings uh, of uh, your disfellowship. Okay, I'll send them. Okay, yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at it, but uh, at this stuff, but I did download it onto my computer. Okay, the just as a an FYI, the breakdown of Smith's Review and Herald articles for Chapter 10 encompass basically two articles. And they, they're they not very long in study, but we, we can have a good conversation about all of this. Yeah, yeah, it would be good. So I have those up. I have those ready to go. So we'll deal with, begin dealing with that this week. All right? Sounds good. Okay. So. Amen. Any other comments or thoughts? Okay. Shall we then close this session of prayer? We thank you, Father, for the blessings and the guidance that you are providing. We thank you for opening our eyes and helping us to consider that which we need to consider at this time. Help us to learn more so that we may give an answer for the faith that is within us. Direct us this day. Help us that all that is done may bring glory to your name and to your character. Be with us each. 
as we go through the day. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.